before. I'm a grassroots journalist and educator in Vatican City, AKA Washington DC, the center of Babylon, the place, the epicenter of the triumphs and the destruction of the black woman and black man. Tonight, this is All Eyes on DC and we're celebrating African culture, black African culture at that, all right? So this is how the rundown of the program is gonna go. We're gonna have an opening selection from a pillar of our community. Um, after that, we're gonna have pretty much a follow-up to last month's discussion about political participation, right, with an announcement about some things that are in place when it comes to United Black African people. Then after that, we will go into our interview, okay? Uh, the main event for the night. Uh, 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 the headline, okay? We gotta give this brother his props. Uh, brother Ahadi Toure has given us his time tonight in the interest of the black African nation to explain what he has been doing in the interest of African fundamentalism. Let's give him a hand, family, please, y'all. So that's pretty much the rundown of the program tonight, all right? Uh, I want Mama Lucy to come on uh, to the front, all right? Lucy! Coming up, all right. and we're gonna do our song against ethnic cleansing. Okay. Right. Somebody gonna knock your hair down. Mama Lucy, please, if if y'all could just talk about that a little bit, you know, what's that song about and all that? Uh, well, this is uh, actually a song. I'm gonna pass out a few sheets for folks who are brave enough to uh, join in with us. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I I've been find all the ones that I made copies of, but it's a very simple song, it's call and response. Um, I'd like to uh, invite Cam Rogers, Al McRae, and Ella Fitzgerald, Marcella, Marcella Fitzgerald, <laughs> to, um, and I, I'm going to give the, the mic to uh, Al to, to lead us. We ain't going to move. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. When we hold together, when we hold together, we make ourselves strong. We make ourselves strong. Together we stay here. Together we stay here. Right where we belong. Right where we belong. We ain't gonna move. is where my children were born, but the landlord says children can stay in my home, somebody please tell me where will we belong, we ain't gonna move. Strong. We make ourselves strong. Together we stay here. Together we stay here. Right where we belong. Right where we belong. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. We ain't gonna move. Ain't gonna move. Ain't gonna move. The landlord has trouble. Cause money, everybody knows, everybody knows, he contributes so much money to the mayor's race. He can fix up my place, but I ain't gonna pay that big increase. We ain't gonna move.
Black Workers Center is located 2500 Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue Southeast. Mm -hmm. It is a project of 1DC and uh, we hope you will join us. Mm, great. Thank you, thank you. Many thanks. Let's give the Black Workers Center course another hand. Sisters and brothers. All right, if you guys enjoyed that, let me get an all eyes on DC. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. Perfect. 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 All right, family. So, next up on the agenda tonight, like I said, is a follow up from a previous discussion that we had. All right, this is pretty much an invitation. Um, for anyone who's up for the call, pretty much, uh, you know, to take what we got to, you know, do to the next level. So I'm going to have my brother William here talk a little bit about what he has in mind, what, what we have in mind, pretty much, for the Black African Nation. Let's give him a hand, y'all. So, um, yeah, as Sam said, you know, one of the things that we really want to talk about, especially this time of year with the election season rolling around, is, you know, Pan-Africanism uniting as a people. Um, one of the things that I feel like, and um, Brother Bailey, who teaches up at UDC, talked about when he was here was, I asked him what was the biggest obstacle for us as a people. And he said that, in his experience, it was psychological. Now, if you don't know Brother Bailey, he was the editor for the paper uh, that Malcolm X had um, for the old AAU, uh, the organization he founded when he separated from the Nation of Islam. Okay. And it was psychological, he said. And basically what he's saying is that there's nothing tangible or physical that's preventing us from moving forward. It's all in our mind. And granted, a lot of it is just social conditioning. The environment around us has conditioned us to believe that we don't have the tools capable. But the reality of it is we all we need, we all we have. All black everything. So um, without further ado, I just want to announce that um, you know, Sam has been a big inspiration for me. You know, we're peers, you know, I'm from Charlotte, came up here about four years ago and was introduced to All Eyes on DC. And uh, ever since then, I was just motivated to act on things that I had been pondering, thinking about, strategizing in my own mind, but you never really know where you want to take out, uh, step out and take that first step. And so Sam was that person that inspired me to actually take that first step. And uh, so, you know, over the last two, two and a half years, I think, We've been discussing some things and strategizing. So we just want to announce to you all tonight that we are establishing the Black Nationalist Party for the Unification of People of African Descent. So as of tonight, we're going to have our first meeting on next Friday here at 8 p.m. If you're interested, the signing sheet goes around in the last column, just put BNP. Make sure you put your telephone number and your email address so that we can contact you and give you information. And pretty much what we want to do is begin to mobilize. Um, what we see a lot in our community and just nationally is a lot of people, you know, uh, protesting, a lot of people marching, a lot of things going on in social media, but we don't see enough of this actual action at the grassroots level. It's the communities and the people that make things happen. It's not the media, it's not the president, it's not these senators. We are the ones that make things happen. When the cities are being made for D.C., they're being made in city council meetings. They're being made in these forms that we can attend, Board of Education meetings but we choose not to, or we just feel like we don't have a vested interest. But the reality of it is, in our absence, decisions are being made that are not in our best interest. And so we have to regain ownership. And so that's something that me and Sam have decided to do. We're gonna take it upon ourselves to bring as many people aboard as we can. And we're not asking anybody to give up anything that you don't wanna get, okay? We're not in the business of trying to convince people we're just moving. And if you agree, move with us. And if you don't, that's fine. This is for all of us. And so we just want to announce that on Friday night. We'll get into a few more details about what the party entails, um, what we want to do, some of the first things we're going to be doing as a party. Um, next Friday, we're going to be having a voter registration drive. So those who are not registered to vote will be registered voters on next Friday evening, as well as introducing you to some candidates in the community that we believe will, if they are not going to further our call, there will at least be a gap measure until we can find someone to fill that void. We want to slowly but surely begin removing those people out of office who don't have our best interests in mind. D.C. is 49% African American. 48% of the voting populace is African American. There's no reason why we should be being gentrified, we should be being removed from decision making, the policies, all of that stuff, it should be in our hands. This is our city. Even though I'm not a native Washingtonian, you are my people, this is my city, OK? 
Okay, so we got to take that ownership, and that's what we're going to do. So I just want to thank you all for your time. Um, again, if you're interested, just write BNP in the last column. We'll reach out to you. The meeting again is next Friday, 8 p.m. right here. And uh, we look forward to starting this journey together. This is not just about having a political presence in D.C. It's not just about having a political presence in America. We're looking to take this internationally. We want a seat at the United Nations. We have no representation as a people. When the Chinese, when they're offended, that's someone that they have to answer to. The Iranians, when they're offended, that's someone they have to answer to. We have no flag. No one that they have to answer to. And as a result, we're taking advantage of. So what we're going to do is change that paradigm so that now when we have issues, when we have grievances, when we have things that we want done, we as a people can come together and speak for ourselves. I'm sorry. So um, again, I just want to thank you all for your time, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sam. Thank you. Let's give him another hand, y'all. Let's give him another hand, y'all. All right, so please keep in mind that that's the science sheet in general, but the third column where it says, you know, how'd you find out about the program, you're more than welcome to sign those three letters, BMP, if you're interested in moving along further. All right, so at this point, I'm going to kindly ask that everybody divert their attention toward the front for the main part of our presentation. All right, this is a part of the presentation that requires a lot of attention as it is directly related to the fundamentals of African liberation, liberating the mind, liberating the spirit so that we can, as an African nation, move forward in everything that we have to do. But culture is the basis for all of that. And in order to know your culture, you have to read, right? And in order to read, right, we're talking about young people, we're talking about people who really you have to access them at a time. And this brother as a millennial, the so-called millennial, right, has found a way to do that. And he has found a way to parlay his creation into other avenues around the community. So we gotta give this brother his just due. All right, I'm gonna read his bio as he comes up, but I want you guys to give a hearty to Ray. Your undivided attention and a big, big round of applause, y'all. Please, let's go, let's go, let's do it. Torre is the founder and CEO of the For the Culture app. And as I'm talking about this, you guys should probably look on your phone and download that right now. All right, so. How do you spell it? For the Culture, the number four. Oh. Number four, the culture. All right, so Howdy Torre, he is the founder and the CEO of For the Culture, a revolutionary app that focuses on providing a one stop shop for people of African descent about information related to financial literacy. The uh, Directory of Black-Owned Businesses, Mental Health, Meditation, Constitutional Rights, and Engagement with Police Officers, along with Swahili Language Lessons. As the CEO and founder, this brother has helped grow this company that's based domestically into international status with more than 62,000 downloads across all seven continents in only nine months since his debut. He, he deserves applause for that, y'all. That, that, All right, this brother, so All Eyes on DC wasn't the first, unfortunately, but it's fine. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, tap into some, to some new stuff here. But this brother has been on different platforms, HBCU Buzz, We Buy Black, and Urbanity Black, okay? In 2016, Torrey also published A Journey to Ahadism. Uh, the Journey to Ahadism chronicles the transformation of this man who was lost and trying to find himself, being a social vanguard for his community. He documented the influences in his life from strong black women and men to movies, proverbs, literature, and African symbols. Since his release, he has sold several copies and has since helped hundreds of people find their path to enlightenment and consciousness. Beautiful. And his brother, as an activist, is also a program coordinator for the 100 Black Men of America, an organization that is the largest network of African-American male mentors here. While there, he built relationships with various communities through organizing programs and events, such as some arena programs, there you go, while wow. local blood drives and donating blankets. He participated in the Global Soap Project in New Orleans, designed to make fresh bars of soap and provide them to those in need. Born in Kenya, but raised in DC, Ahadi Torre studied political science and marketing at Morgan State University. 
He currently tours the country to various schools, raising the consciousness of youth. And when he's not traveling, he's at home raising his young, beautiful daughter. Bahati Sore, everybody. Let's give him a hand. Uh, that's a beautiful bio. I, I, it's, it, it's always great reading bios about people. Uh, you know, I think we really got to give people their roses while they're here. And you really accomplished so much in your less than 30 years of life. Uh, in, the, in the spirit of what we're here for today, you know, it being on the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey's birthday, um, it being Black August, right? And us just celebrating culture. If you could just talk to us about how, um, how the legacy of Garvey, but beyond that, how, how the concept of Pan-Africanism has influenced you deeply and your work. Man. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Y'all can hear me? Yeah. All right, I guess I got to speak in there a little bit more. Um, again, my name is Ahadi Tore. Um, I was born in Kenya, uh, raised in DC. I've been here for about 20 years now. I've seen a lot of change um, in the community. You know, and uh, for me, uh, Black August has been in my life for a long time, for my dad, and my mom, I mean, it's, it's a lot of uh, going back and forth, uh, learning about being African and being American <coughs> against the devil consciousness that we go through. Um, I think for me, you know, Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey was a pioneer for me, um, as he was to all of us, because of the fact of what he stood for, you know, and uh, just looking at that pan-African flag, like that's, that's one of the things that, like yeah, we need to walk with. Like we see the American flag everywhere we go, you know, the pride, because they, they know their history, or what they think is their history. Um, and I think for us, we just search for identity. Um, for me, you know, uh, Marcus Garvey, he was one of the first people that I put on the app for people to be more aware. Um, I think a lot of times we get caught up in what the media like to express, such as Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X, or something, like certain people that they like to spotlight. Um, without giving credit to those that, you know, planted, planted the seeds, you know. And, um, for me with this app, I think one of the biggest things that I like to know, you know, from people that download the app is how did it change your life? You know, so um, once a week I try to reach out to people and get just to hear their testimony on the app and see how it changed. And I hear things like, <laughs> crazy things like my, my parent, my mom, who was in Texas was like, you know, I use your app as a resource for my kids that are homeschooled. You know, and that was about that was about three months within the app. And I was still tweaking things, I was still trying to figure out how I wanted to do things. Uh, was it too much information? Was it too little information? Like these things that I that I battle with. Um, and when she said that, I knew it was real. You know, anytime someone take your work and want to apply it to their everyday life, you know, that was big for me. So just hear things like that or hearing business owners, black business owners saying that their profit went up 100 or 200% because of the fact that I was able to promote them on my app. You know, um, with the app, it's free. I made it free because I know how, how how frugal we are as people and how we want to, you know, uh, spend our money on what we want to. You know, we hate when people say, you need to eat better or you need to spend your money on um, less clothes and more books. You know, and um, I got tired of people basically being belittled in their in their lifestyle. So what I did was, you know, um, I took a page out of uh, Brother Garvey's book when um, his whole Back to Africa movement. Um, I was able to go back when I was 12 and about um, when I was about 18 to go back. When I went back to, I went back when I was 12 to um, handle my rights to passage. Um, it's a real thing, uh, from boy to man. Um, me and a few other good brothers, we actually had to go through a process together for about three months uh, where we didn't know each other at all. And as we went out on our own, I seen all the skills that they had. Uh, one brother was good when it came to medic, another was good at hunting when it came to fish, it came um, cleaning it and skin, things like that. And I'm looking around like, you know, what, what can I do? I'm from America, uh, I already had a cultural background like they had. But as I looked around, they can do what they do on an individual level, but they couldn't handle themselves collectively. So that's why I came in. Like, this all, like, just 
we all natural born leaders, but at the same time, sometimes we gotta look to others for advice. You know, so I was able to connect with them on the sense of giving them direction. Not saying that these brothers were smart, because they was. They all have uh, a skill that they achieved through their lifetime, and I was able to bring them all together. So um, I felt like, you know, that I took a page out of uh, Brother Garvey's book when it came to that, and um, yeah, he's been leading me ever since in spirit. Wow, very, very profound. Yes. Uh, let's elaborate further on your, the, the rites of passage that you mentioned. Uh, would you say it was at that point that you really realized or that you understood your leadership qualities and being able to, because it seems like to me that it translated over to your work. If you had 62,000 downloads all across the world, you had people fo focus all on one thing, you know, so would you say that was a moment where you learned to bring together different pieces? Yeah, I, w I would say that was a start. Um, definitely a transition. Like, it was a transition for me. Um, going back to Kenya, like I said, and going through this process, it was about three months that we had. To, um, we had a ceremony where we sat down uh, with the elders in the community, and they all gave us, you know, different tasks, and they gave us tasks together, like, as a uh, collective group. And then we went on. And one thing I would say is, you go through things with, with people. Um, and it tests you on all abilities, like especially when, you know, we like to say we are men, you know, and we all have our own agenda, um, but we don't know how strong we are when we come together. So um, from that point on, you know, I was able to start like changing my ways, start looking at different leaders, because a lot of times we like to lead or we like to do things without looking at the history of things. You know, we, prime example, we have a lot of organizations out here that's all doing the same thing. When, if they would have just sat down and actually came together, we could have infused a lot of these different organizations. And understand that everything, we have to put in perspective to the sense of, well, we're gonna take care of your business first and then not take care of mine, or vice versa. Prime example, Rosa Fox and Martin Luther King, they, they had a disagreement because um, Rosa Fox cared about women's rights, which is fair. It's fair, we need it. They needed their rights. But also, Martin King brought them civil rights. And he said, once we take care of civil rights, then we can take care of women's rights. But they was on the same page. You know, that's just one of many examples, you know, that you've been taking place, you know. But other than that, like from that, from that, I went to, you know, just studying the greats, you know, the big people that get the media attention to the small people that don't get the media attention. You know, and once I understood that, um, like I was telling uh, earlier, you know, each generation have, they have a mission. All you, all you can do is fulfill a mission or you can abandon a mission. And you know, um, and some, you know, in my sense right now, I think I'm pretty much trying to accomplish the mission. So yeah, like from that right of passage, it was definitely a transformation for me. The African unity, well, the unity among the men that you were talking about, um, later on, you spoke about how different organizations uh, just can't seem to get it right when it comes to, you know, doing the same thing but just overlapping. Uh, if that's a part of our culture, unity, why is it that that same unity can't translate over to our organization? You know, if we are truly as African people, we're reading these these great people and we're saying that we're taking on what they told us. But at the same time, there's not enough, you know, what is it about that that makes us not want to take the unity to the next level? Um, I think for me, uh, just from research and experiencing like different things in life, I think for me, I see a lot of people who want to be the man or the main man or the main woman, you know, it comes like, I want to be that person that's on TV, I want to be that person that that, that say, we fantasize about like the Martin Luther Kings or the Malcolm X and these Marcus God, it's like to the point where we're looking at the figure instead of the message and, and it's, it can get, it can get difficult at times. I think for me, I see a lot of organizations, right? We, we come at, we got a great idea um, or we might not like your idea or their idea and it's like, I'm going to spit off. A lot of times you see foreigners coming to the country and they might all have different ways they want to make money. But if 
is threatening them or their people, they're going to band together for a common cause. Now, granted, if it's all of us right here, we march up to Georgetown and we are in a community that's not our faith, it's a white community, and we sit right here and we make a noise, we're being disruptive to the, to the community. And no matter what background they come from, they will come out and defend their property or their area. But for us, we make it about individualism, and that's what things get out. Um, and I think, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers here, but it's a generational gap. Uh, we have a lot of our parents or grandparents, they sit up there, and like I said, at that time it was good. Like we were just having a conversation on how, um, in their generation, maybe working 20 years and you know, and then retiring and things like that was the norm. You know, it was something to do. Or well, maybe it wasn't to some. But at the same time, being right here, being 25 years old, I can say I can say that a lot of people in my generation, we start, we are starting from from a low level, from a little to nothing, and we tired of being patient. Um, we are in a position where uh, sometimes being patient is too. It, it, it could be a bad thing, being patient. You know, so a lot of people say millennials are un. They not they they impatient. You know, they don't want work. They don't want work for things. And they don't want to. They want to do this, do that. But for me, I think um, we do want to work for things. We just want to do it our way. You know, um, a lot of times throughout history, we focus on, or our people focus on, uh, political gain, um, and we lack, or it was a small effort to financial base. You know, when it comes to the financial base, it controls everything. We all know land controls a lot. When you get land, you get power, you get finances, you get all these different things, you know. Um, but for me, I think that it's a generation who got to answer your question. I think we need to come together. I think each of us, we, are, we got different generations in here. I think each of us should at least take the time to learn about 15%, just 15% of each generation that came before you or after you if you can. That's all we ask for. We're not telling you to take um, a millennium under the wing um, if you can, that would be great, but if you can't do that, then at least try to get the understanding without knocking down their lifestyle, you know, teaching them and stuff. So if, I, so if I could throw a wrench in there real quick, you know, this is not putting anybody in the trick bag, but just to pose a question to you. In one breath, and this is, I'm speaking more so to my fellow millennials here, you know, we're building that millennials, we got elders in the audience here, right? So in one breath, we say, all right, let us do us. We know what the game is, right? But in the other breath, we say that the elders ain't really there for us. They're not trying to build with us, right? Now, I'm a man of nuance. I know that their shades are gray. But what is the perfect balance, if there is one, between the elders letting us do us and us meeting them halfway and listening, right? To understand what the pitfalls were when they were doing their thing at the height of their careers, right, as pan Africanists and such. Um, I think for me, I think for us as millennials, I think we do need to listen. I'm not going to lie about that. We are reactionary as a collective. We are. We like somebody go beat up a brother down on Georgia Avenue or up Georgia Avenue. We're ready to go. With no plan, no action, we're just ready to go. And I think at times that's where um, some of our elders can step in. Um, a lot of times their way, um, just been at the set of the feet of our ancestors is a blessing. You know, but they have to want to do it. Like you said, when they was mid twenties and thirties, they was motivated like us. They had the fire. They was pushing. But as you get older, you get tired. I mean, that's human nature. You get tired of talking about the same stuff. So what you do is, um, how 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 I broke it down was, you know, we are considered a living right now. As you get as you get older, you switch. You become a baba. You become, you become a mama. Like you you become right there. And then as you transition, you become a, like an elder. Like that's, it's, it's, a, it's a process, you know? And I think, you know, for us, we willing to learn. We are, but it's just like, you, you can't teach us about just be little in our ways. Like technology is different these days. You know, I'm, I'm on a computer, you know, working on my app and my mom can sit right there and say, you've been on that computer all day. You ain't go to work, you didn't do nothing, but I am making money. I'm making money on a computer, it's at different times. You might have your grandkids or your kids on YouTube all day, but if they got enough followers, they making money. 
it's different ways that we make it revenue. It's a different way that if it's a different way that we move. You know, so I would like to understand like like how did y'all move? And y'all can look at how did we move. All we see is textbooks and we see um videos, but you guys lived in that era where things went down. Not saying that things didn't go down, not it's, it's not going down now in our generation, but it's different. So I would like at least one the two times a week where we can come and we can get the different generations to come in and talk about things. What were some of y'all problems? You know, because it can help us not make the same mistakes. You know, or it might be things that we might try to start an organization right now. And one of y'all can sit there and say, oh, well, back in 72, this, this organization was in place, just like what you want to do now. How about you go look at their bylaws, look at how they ran things, and see what worked and see what didn't work. Like, I'm a big fan of canvassing. You know, I'm a millennial, but I like to canvass. With my app, I like to go and I like to knock on doors in the hood. Check out this app. I ain't a politician, I'm not asking for no money. I'm not asking for, I'm asking you to download this app. Could you be on your phone or not? And it's free. So just, like I said, just get in a space where we can um, talk about ideas, talk about solutions, be open-minded to change, because it's no offense to any of these, any other organization, organizations that have been around for years, but we kind of like in this in this position, like we stagnant right now. You know, how can we get over there? Like, I was just talking to a friend. My app been out for ten months now. We hit over eighty thousand downloads across seven continents. Right? If, if forty years pass and we in the same position, or we don't have storefronts, or we don't have schools, or we don't have different facilities or institutions to help my people, we have failed. My team has failed. We have failed because. Talking about it and 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 moving and progressing slowly, like that's not the way we're trying to go. Like we know change don't happen overnight, but you get a message through there overnight through social media. It's different from having to wait till the newspaper come out the next day. You get it overnight. Well, trust me, I've been dealing with that since I started working at the Washington Informer again. Just seeing the paper come out, but getting getting used to the fact, you know. Of course, I, I'm, I'm used to. I'm used to seeing, you know, the copy right there online and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll give it to the elders, though. There's no high better than seeing stuff in print sometimes, so I enjoy that balance as well. Uh, I want to get back to you about us taking our fight on the Internet and um, making it something where it's going 40 years without regretting it. That's a good point that you made, and I want to touch on that later on. But before we do that, if you could talk to us about the selection of the historical figures and events. I remember seeing, uh, I recall seeing uh, Black Wall Street on there. Um, definitely saw Garvey. I saw Sir Jonah Truth. Uh, Ida B. Wells. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ida B. Wells, man. Listen, where are my journalists at in here? Where are my aspiring writers? Ida B. Wells, I know you hip to her, man. Listen, Ida B. Wells, they 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 drove her out of Memphis. You know, well, that, that's that's what they do because they're terrorists, right? But she did it, but because she was unearthing terrorism, the lynching, right, that they were doing down there. So I'm very appreciative for that, right? But can you talk to us briefly, or as much, you know, at, just talk to us briefly about the selection, right? You know, how do you go about choosing these specific figures in these in these moments in time? I think it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because I like having conversations. Like I can just talk to someone and I and they spark an idea. Like we don't have this big black book that tells us what's the next thing that we're going to put on the app. How it works is we have conversations like this and they spark ideas. It's a million issues that's going on in a black community, but we can't tackle all of them at the same time. So what I did was I actually took a page out of Instagram book. Instagram before, before we see it, like right now, it was this uh, platform that was social media. It was like pictures and video. It was like a ton of things. But before they launched, like two weeks before they launched, they wiped everything off and just put, just made it as a picture app because they wanted to make it as simple as possible. So what I did was, it was a ton of stuff on the app that I wanted to put on there from. Um, so it's certain things like kings and queens on there before slavery. That's big for the kids. It's, it's, yeah. it's big because it gives them the information or the insight on, wow, before slavery, I was actually somebody. You know, and like, 
these figures that I put on there, these are some of the figures that people might know of, but they might not know what they do. You know, that was that was that's one of the big things I do. Like on panel discussions, or I might have a polls, or you know, I might have surveys on. Ask them, you know, what what ancestor do you know the least about, and that that would give us that platform to to push. Just like we all see um, constantly, like Martin Luther King, they promote him so much. As like this hero, which he was a hero. I'm not knocking him, he was a hero for what he did. But you see the media, they never, we call Malcolm X the press of the movie. You know, he, he definitely did what he had to do, but he don't get acknowledged as much because of how he went to the system. To your point about King, the thing is, and uh, Brother C.R. Gibbs, who you guys have to see come Sunday the 26th at Durgan Marshall Center between three and eight, C.R. Gibbs, uh, spoke about Martin Luther King, the other side of King, where King was actually involved in Pan-African movements. King was at Nkrumah's inauguration. Don't get it twisted, you know, not, not taking away from what you said, but you're definitely right, because the media, the mainstream media, they're gonna show us I have a dream. They're not gonna show us Pan-African is King. They're not gonna show us Mountaintop King. They're not gonna show us, you know, let us get our just do King, you know? So they have a different way of manipulating, you know, but, you spoke about getting people that aren't often known, you know? And beyond that, um, what are some other criteria that you have, you know? Because as a journalist, I often think about the power of words, you know? And you don't, and you know, as writers and people who produce media, we often have to be careful about putting things out there that can be used against us. And I know you're pretty sensitive to that as well. You know, so if you can just speak about that aspect a little bit, just um, how much thought goes into really, um, really doing it so that you know you're not choosing not not the wrong people, but like just giving the true history where you know I guess even people's indiscretions are put out there, giving people a really accurate history of some of our leaders, you know? Like even the whole Booker T. Washington thing, right? I remember seeing his speech on there, you know? And people, they have their ways about him and stuff like that, but oftentimes we don't have a total history of who those people are. So I'm just thinking as a writer, you know, do you often keep that in mind about the accuracy with which you portray our leaders on the app? Yeah, so what we do is, um how the team work is we might come up with an idea or a person that we want to feature next. And um, we do extensive research, you know, uh, make sure um, you gotta watch out what media out, like whatever media um, outlets that you use and things like that, what books that we go by. Like um, each, of my each, each of my team members that I have on the app is required to read a book. So the book we're reading right now is Black Economics. Like that's the book that we're reading right now. So each, each time you finish a book, we have to report, because a lot of people, they tend to get a book or get information. They like to put it in their brain and then like to talk to it to other people, right? But how can you apply that information to your everyday life? How can you become a hoarder of information when it's just recycled information? Like everything that's in the app is recycled in a sense of, our, one of our ancestors said it before, you know, and um, for me, I think you have to be careful. Like you said, like we have, so we have a social wall on the For the Culture app. It's called For the Culture Social. And we might post a question out there that might say, who would you prefer, W.E.B. Uh, -E Divorce or Booker T? Well, it's a trick question the whole time. We just want to see how people respond to it. So by the end of the day, we would give them a summary of why both men was important. You know, why both, because a lot of times, you know, we might get, oh, higher education was the key. Or some might say trade school was the key. Where in reality, we needed both. You know, we need skill. We need, yeah. we need different pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, and that's, and that's the thing. So, um, a lot of times people put um, the boys versus Washington, they might say King versus X, when in reality, even though they disagree on certain things, they still was trying to accomplish the same thing, which is liberation. You know, so, um, I think, and another thing is, I think for us with the app, you know, we just, we trying to create a platform because there's a lot of people, even some people might be in this room where 
they might think, well, that person more conscious than me, or that person more quote unquote woke as me. And I don't want to raise my hand, I don't want to ask a question because they might say that why why I don't know this information. So the app is like another safety blanket for someone that just starts to quote unquote wake up. When you can go in the comfort of your home and look at the things, you know, you'd be on your way to work to look at the posts and things like that because a lot of times, and we know that the ego is killing the conscious community. You know, it's to the point where it's like, man, you you doing this, you doing that, and it's like, yo, chill. I'm just, I'm just waking up. You know, I'd rather be late than never. I mean, as we say, and you gotta remember, like, we know Detroit Red. You know, we we know how that life was. Like, we we know how everyone had a past life. You know, even myself before the transformation, like running the streets and doing this, doing that's like. It's all about who you are now, like what's going on now. So I think the app itself, it gives people that time where they can be working out. It's videos on there, like uh, mess the grassroots, like the speech on there, anything on there where you can listen to that, even though you're working out, you know, that that can help. So um, yeah, the app, it's, it's one of them things where you can sit right there, you can take your time. It's not a class, it's not a grade. Like, it's what, 53, it's 53 countries. At 54 countries in Africa, um, and we make up the 55th, I, I consider African Americans because of the fact that, you know, we was born, well, a lot of African Americans were born in the belly of the beast. So here in America, you know, there's so many different types of being black, but who are you to be little someone because they look at things a little different, you know, than you? And I see, I see that a lot. So the app is like, it's a platform where you can be yourself and open up to the information. Speaking of which, you know, you speak about people here in the Western world, they call that the sixth, um, sixth region. So, so you got your 54 countries, of course, but you also have African people all over the diaspora. You know, so I definitely think that we have to recognize that, you know, just that we are all over the world. And part of that, you know, which is why I'm glad that you have this app, part of the fear that we have amongst ourselves is that, is that we think deep down inside subconsciously that we're a minority. When in fact minority, again going back to the wordplay, was the word used to make us stop ourselves in the first place. You know, so it, it's it's very tricky. Uh, before we go on to the next question, everybody do me a favor, hold your phones up, please. If you if your phones aren't up, hold them up, please. Hold them up, hold them up. All right, I'm gonna need y'all to go on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, and use the All Eyes on DC hashtag, please. I'm back. All Eyes on DC. Like just, just say one thing about it. Take a photo, something. You know, let the people know where you at right now. All right. I need a time check. Everybody have time? All right, perfect. We got time. All right. Uh, at 9.35, we're going to open it up for audience Q&A. So I'm really going to need the audience members to uh, get their thinking caps on. And let's build, all right, in the interest of the black African nation. Brother Hadi, so I think our conversation has taken us to the most important question here. And it goes back to what you said about us capitalizing on this moment and doing something where 40 years from now we're not regretting, right? All the talking and all that other stuff, right? So. You mentioned something very powerful, man. I think this is gonna be one of the best interviews of all eyes. Like, when you talk about millennials, right? You said, right, and I agree with you. If you're just, hey, family, family, I, I, I'm asking y'all kindly, you know, because it's, it's recorded too. You know, we, the family abroad and on the internet, they gotta hear us too. All right, now, When you're first going into your consciousness, like you said, you might be a little, uh, you might not want to jump out there yet and ask questions because the ego, right, it tells us that, you know, okay, if you don't know this much, then you, you shouldn't be that, you know, prominent. So, okay, of course, downloading this app might be the first way to get into that, right? But then, how do we as millennials, right, not get too caught up in the internet? How do we... Because I see even for myself sometimes, I'll admit that, you know, I'll be bold enough to say, we do get caught up in the internet a lot, right? And and like, and I talk to elders sometimes who say that they don't like internet, they don't like conference calls, they like feeling, you know, they like being in the space with their comrades, you know, 
and just feeling, feeling the spirit, feeling all of that. Like it's, the other stuff is just too impersonal. So given where we are in this rat race, right, in this Babylon system, in the age of social media, where do you see, how do you see us breaking? Or how do you see you using the app to unite those 62,000 people to make it so that if even not globally, in their pockets of the world, they can come together face to face and take this fight to the next level? So one of the biggest things that we're doing right now um, is we are updating our social, so how it works is the social wall that's on the app, it's like a Twitter feed. If you think about Twitter, it's where people can post pictures, they can post comments, quotes, whatever it may be. They can talk to each other, things like that. They create a profile. Once they create that profile, then we have that information. And we, what we do is we try to connect them on different levels. So right now, in the making, we are trying to get the photo culture app in different languages. Like right now it's in English. I have a lot of people that reach out to me abroad and they say like, how can I get it translated? You know, so we working on that. Um, but I think for me, um, just telling people to get out there, like to, to do things. One of the biggest things that we about to add is a calendar. Now, how the calendar works right now is, it's a lot of events that are going around in DC. You know, I got different, um, our SS feeds, which is like just live updates of different people websites where events might be posted, you know, but a lot of times I think that's where the elders step in. Um, let them know how beneficial it is to get out there. Now I could be sitting right here saying, I want y'all to download my app. I want y'all to connect on the app. But if I'm not out there within the community, how can I say I'm a community based app? How do I talk about nation building? if I don't set up the right tools for our students. So for instance, right now, uh, we are raising money to go on the Florida Culture School Tour. Within the school tour, we are talking about the app. We letting people know. Let me know, how many people, how many people in here know the percentage of black-owned tech companies? Y'all are just throwing out, throwing percentage out there. 21. Seven? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. So it's 2%, it's 2%. And we hit, we are in that 2% when it comes to tech companies, we're app building. So me and my team are putting together um, a tour to go to different high schools. Right now we have five high schools that signed up. That we're gonna go in and we're trying to get um, DCPS to pay for us to teach the kids coding. Because according to Forbes Magazine, by 2020 it's gonna be more tech jobs than anything. You know, so why not equip our kids with the necessary tools. You know, we have all these different schools. We have all this, this pride. I went to an HBCU. We have a lot of pride for our school. You know, we have a lot of pride for them colors that we're in. And even um, here at Howard, like we have a lot of people, I have a lot of friends that went to Howard that show us pride. You know, they yell HU everywhere they go. They wear their colors and there's nothing wrong with that. But just imagine if we have that Pan African flag or we have that we have that alliance with each other where when we see that flag, that means that we're united. You know, you see a lot of times, even with, you know, not last weekend, um, when some of the white nationalists came down and they was united because they have an identity. You know, we we in a position right now where some people might say, I'm not even African. Like, you'd be like, what? <laughs> like, you know, some of the things, it's like, how do we close that gap? That's a that's a question right there. Like you got a lot of brothers and sisters that sit right here and say, "I'm not African. I'm American." You know that's and that's it's mind blowing, but it's the reality of things. Like we sit right here and we want to be, we want to be down for the cause. We want to fight for this and that, but it's like, what are we fighting for? We are on so many different fronts right now. You have men that want to fight for liberation. You got some men want to fight for just economic gain. Like some people, like it's so many different levels and so many different fights that we want to attack, but we have to be able to sit down. And like you said, when it comes to social media, you don't have to announce everything on social media. You know, and I think that's what a lot of the elders, they might say, dang, if y'all trying to attack the enemy, you telling the enemy exactly what you do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, go to Malcolm X Park at two o'clock, you got to fight. 
You know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's, it's, it's interesting because um, one of my mentors, Brother Talet, but he back there recording, like he always talk about like just, you know, just, just having that backup plan. A lot of our leaders, they have international connections. And one day we're gonna have to lead this place. Um, I'm not saying for a permanent cause, but we have to recruit with our brothers and sisters on the continent. You know, that's just real. Like they have a different spirit about them. I mean, um, some know more than others and some know none, you know, it, it just depends. So um, I think for me, man, I just think that, you know, this app is one way. Like this app is just the beginning of what I'm trying to do. Like it's, it's interesting because everyone get fascinated about this app and I tell them there's only one calling. You know, my goal is to be able to spread liberation how much as I can. Like, that's that's all it is. You know, we talk a good game. Black folks talk a good game. You know, and you might say, what can you do to, what can you do can, to contribute to the, the black liberation struggle, right? For one, support black businesses. That's one, of the, that's one thing. Right now, everybody got phones. Download it for the culture app. Not for me, not, not to make my ego jump, but for the black businesses that pay to be on there to get exposure. For the brothers and sisters that talk about meditation on there, that do yoga on there, all these people that contribute to it, you know. That's a perfect segue. If you wouldn't mind talking about those businesses, I saw a couple on there. Uh, one of the brothers featured on For The Culture app, like you just mentioned the brother Talib, he's actually here tonight. We gotta give him a hand too. For uh, pass all eyes on these two guys. One time, uh, so, uh, which, if you wouldn't mind talking to us about that, because, you know, you actually, it speaks to what you were just talking about earlier, like you said, supporting black business. So how it works is, um, how many people own black businesses? In, how, how many people own a black business in here? All right, I see some, I see some. How many people want to, want to start a black business? Right? So there's a lot of hands up, right? But you sometimes people don't know where to start. It's like I have this idea, but I can't act on it. I don't know what to do at all. Well, I don't have the money. Well, I don't have the knowledge, whatever it may be. So how it works is, the For the Culture app has a tier program. So we have tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier three is $10 a month. How many people have Netflix in here? Netflix, Hulu, um, Apple Music, Tidal, like Spotify, Spotify, all these things that get your money monthly, right? For you to enjoy yourself. You know, why not? support your business, invest in yourself for $10 a month to be able to get push notifications to 80,000 people across seven continents. That's how it works. When you sign up for the business, you can have the $10 a month plan, the $30 a month plan, and the $50. The difference is the $30 a month, you get push notification to everyone, but you also, you also get featured on our social media pages and you get the email list and things like that. But the premium, you get the best of the best. You get you get push notifications, you get an email list of 50,000 people, you get analytics for your business, who clicked your business, where they click it at, what time, what state. You get all these different things because we did our research. And according to the market, black businesses, right? How much, they don't spend that much money on marketing. You know what they say? Word of mouth, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. That's what they do. They don't believe in themselves enough, or they don't trust themselves, or they don't trust their product enough to let someone else promote it. So that's why we're here. This is what we do. We sit right here, it's, it's no, we're not selling you nothing. It's not, it's not in the sense of we just trying to get rich. It's a process. Now, if you go in there and you reach out to any of these businesses, anybody from someone that cut hair, someone that sell insurance. Like I do extensive research on these black businesses because I'm not gonna allow you to come up here and sell something that's gonna hurt the community. How is that productive? You know, so we have anybody from high school students, middle school students that sell ice cream, that sell all these type of things to multimillionaire businesses that's on the app. Like, I know five people that you don't know, at least. You know five people I don't know, and it, it works, it's a connection. Right now, we just hired 20 brand ambassadors across 10 states 
and three countries. And the next stop is to conquer every HBCU, at least one brand ambassador from every HBCU to be the face of the Florida Culture app in that demographic. So with the app itself, it's just giving small businesses an opportunity to go on the platform to sell your product. I know with your business, everybody wanna make money, right? It don't matter, you wanna make money, you wanna find a way to put yourself out there and the Florida Culture app, that's the perfect way to do it. Hey, let's give this brother a hand, man. He just dropped so much. Not only did he drop science, he gave us a course of action, and it sounds like he's doing the nation building. Well, not just him, he has a team, of course. You know, if you can talk about that a little bit, um, who are the members of your team? Um, so I, I don't know how you want to start something, you want, you want, what's the, what's the, what's the saying? Everybody gonna eat, right? Right, I started off with 15 people. You know, handpicked every single one of them. Like, yo, we're gonna build this empire, and we're gonna go for it. Six months went by. Some of them just weren't cut out for it. And it's okay, it's fine, it's business. I have a daughter, she needs to eat. If you slacking on your job, then you take the food out of her mouth. Right, when it comes to your loved ones and, what you, and who you care about, if they take your food out of their mouth, then you, you you ain't with the game, man. That's that's in any generation. I don't care, you know, where you from. So how it works is I have um, I have six members, there's seven including myself. Um, and I had picked them. They all went to HBCUs. Uh, some people would say, oh, are you discriminating? No, I'm not discriminating. I've just seen their work ethic and what they do. You know, so we have anywhere from public relations um, to uh, so I have a COO that deals with everyday operations. I have uh, VP of uh, operations. I have, and all these, all these people I met, and I say they work, and I work with them in mutual settings. So it's not just me just looking at a resume saying, oh, I want to choose this person because they look good on paper. It's the work after. It's when Freddie, Freddie Gray died, and you know we went out there, and you know different things that we was doing. Just looking at some people that went to Morgan. Some people came from different places, and like. That invites you, like, you know, we, we are spiritual people. You know, we are spiritual people having physical moments. That's all we are right now, you know? So when you get that vibe about a person, it's like, it's something about you. So you put them through a little bit of time. What do you think about liberation? What's your definition of liberation? You know, um, what do you think about the, the state of African Americans in the community? Different things like that. So they had to go through an extensive interview process. Interview by like, the average interview is probably like a, you go like two or three interviews at most, you know. But I be, believe it or not, they went through an interview process for a month. And my people said, that might be too much. But the fact is, I did it because I wanted to choose the right people. This idea that I had, I researched for six or seven months. And once I did the research, I had to put together a dream team. I call them a dream team. I was born in 92, so I like to look at the year 92 and see what are the, com the accomplishments in 92. You know, so I, I chose these people because of the fact of how hard they work. And now they help me make a decision. They don't get paid, people. They don't get paid. So you ask me, how do they still do what they do on an everyday basis? Well, since I can't pay them, I did the next best thing. I each gave them shares of the company. I gave them shares of the company. So the only people that have it is them six, myself, and my daughter. I'm the only people that have access. They can't sell their shares outside. They can't do anything like that. But they had to believe in the vision. And they had to believe in the upscale of what I was trying to do. And it went from my dream to their dream. Now, yeah, we get frustrated at times. We argue at times. But at the end of the day, it's about us being a family, about us being together, you know, so. So that sounds like a co-op to me. Like a co-op, mm -hmm. communalistic type mm -hmm. deal you got going on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. Wow. So, it sounds like you've come to terms with the fact or with the reality that all of us ain't going to make it. What, uh, that's what it sounds like to me. If there were 15 and then six of y'all left and you kept it moving, it sounds like at some point you was just like, man, hey, see y'all, you know, you know, tell me about that. You know, just that, that that philosophy, you know, 
I think, um, so I'm, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. So when it first started, <laughs> it was it was respect, but it was like, you're a black owned business. Y'all know how the myth goes when, oh, as a black owned business, you're not organized, you don't have your paperwork right. You, you just winging it. That's what they think. That's what they thought it was. And there's no shade towards anybody that, that I came across and I thought that was fit for the job that wasn't. But I asked him a question. Why are you late to the meeting? Why are you not dressed up to the meeting? Business time. But if I was Steve Jobs, you'll be dressed up here 30 minutes early and all these different things, right? And I asked him that, and they looked at me crazy because I demanded the same respect as a Steve Jobs. As a Warren Buffett. As a balance, CJ Walker. That's, I mean, we're going to be honest, like, you know, it's, they looked at me funny because it's like, we're the same age, so why do you, why you ride me like this? You know, but it was a, it's tough. We all know. Some people say, oh, we got all the times out here, we got cool, whatever you want to call them, whatever it may be. But we, we must understand that it will be times where it's going to be, the worst enemy is going to be the person right across from you. And you can try to save them as much as possible. It's, it's fine. It's fine. You got own family members. Brother Tyler, like he tell me all the time, man, look, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to fight the battles. Like some of the people that you love, you're gonna try to help them as much as you can. And then you just go, you gotta go. You gotta go. Like um, message to the graduates when <laughs> Brother Axe, he always talked about it. He said, man, you had this Asian girl for her dad on his knees. And, and she asked him, like, are you going to fight for the liberation of our people? And he was considered an Uncle Tom. So what she did was, she shot him. She killed her own father because that was blocking her and her kids and her grandkids from liberation. So I like to ask people sometimes, like, I'm not going to ask y'all right now, but I would like to ask people sometimes, like, if the ones you care about is blocking your liberation, what actions do you take? Like, just because all my skin folks, not my kin folks. We heard that before, right? Just because you black, all right, Ben Carson, right? Ben Carson. You know, we like to look at him like, yo, you was a prodigy in what you did, but how you turned out for our people is tough. Like, we, we don't really rock with you like that. You know, we took that black card, you know, because it's one of the things that, that you have to, like I said, you gotta be, you gotta be willing to accept. You know, you don't want to take one of your brothers with you and at the end of the day, he stabbed you in the back. You don't, you don't want that, you know, so you pick and choose. But there's good people out there. It's, it's, it's good people, good people out there. Some need more guidance than others. Like, but you gotta be patient. You gotta understand, we've been through generations of, generations and generations of just being tormented mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. You gotta remember, some call this our land because of what our ancestors did and because how they built this from the ground up. But some people, they had to go back. Like when I big, went back to the continent, you know, it felt like a different, I felt like a superhero. So like to be honest, like that's a whole other feeling going back. You're not telling everyone to go back at least once because it'll change your life. You know, but yeah, like, I mean, we just gotta get to the part, the, the, the idea that everyone is not gonna come with us. And it's fine. Like once you, once you understand that, then you can move forward. Then you can surround yourself with people, surround yourself with people that actually want to make a difference. You know, you, you might be hanging around somebody like, man, you talk that black power stuff too much. All right, now that I know I got to adjust my circle. You know, and it's just real, it's fine. It's fine, you know, so that's that's how my team is. Like, I'm hard on them uh, because I want the best for them. Like, the For the Culture app, for them, it's just, it's just to, to, to open the door, to get in the door. That's what I tell them. Any activities they have, any projects they have, I say, give them to me, I'm gonna put them on the app. I'm gonna share with all 80,000 followers. Why? Because it's not just about me. Because if it's just about me, if something, God forbid, if something happened to me, then the vision of the app would die. So what I do is, I'm teaching my team how to code. I'm teaching them how to be able to put things on the app. I'm teaching them how to speak. When I say speak, I'm talking about speak on behalf of the For The Culture app. So, Somebody won't come out and get a sound bite where something sound like it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's just bad, you know? So crazy thing is like, I had to set social media policies. I was never even thinking about social media policies, but when you wear that For The Culture shirt, and when you represent that brand, and when you got that in your bio, you have to act accordingly. True story, 
I just learned this today. Um, one of my uh, team members, he was on an interview for Grambling State to be a P uh, public relations director. They broke up the For the Culture app because of his page and how he promotes it. So he's been interviewed for a university and they broke up things on his social media page. And they broke up things about For the Culture. And they actually loved it, which is crazy. Cause I told them, I just, all I had was a dollar and a dream, man. That's all it was, you know? So uh, with my team, um, it allowed them to not only understand the concept of coding and what they want to do, but it also helps them develop their skills. You know, so we, we start seminars um, or webinars um, in the next year, and each of them will have a webinar where they focus on a particular skill that they have. You know, so that's what we're doing right now for that. Perfect. Uh, last question before I give it to the audience. And uh, who has questions for this uh, brother? Raise your hand if you got questions for him. Raise your hands high. Let me see. Okay, all right. I see a couple. All right, perfect. All right, perfect. All right. Uh, before we get into the audience questions, I got one more question for you, and this is related more to your app, to your school program that you're um, in the in the process of putting through DCPS. Uh, if you can, as briefly as possible, you know, just given the fact that you know some young people they have some apprehensions about math and science, you know, they don't want to go into it, and you have pretty much provided a concrete example of why math and science is useful in making money for yourself and building, right? What would a lesson look like where you're translating the fundamentals of math and science into code? Um, one of the biggest things, like you said, is making, making the lesson itself fun. Um, so I have a seven-year-old daughter and she, when I walked in the house one day, she was like, Dad, you popular. I said, what you mean? She was like, you got an app. Cause she liked to download apps on the phone and on the iPad and things like that. And I was like, nah, I'm just all right, I'm just decent. You know, just, you know, downplaying it. And she gave me a good idea. This was like in the beginning. She said, you have anything on there for kids? You know, you have anything on there for kids. So what we're doing now is actually Monday, we're gonna have a focus game on there where the kids can, whoever know the game like, human games like Bop It and things like that where you know you have to, it's like a, you gotta memorize things like that. Like it's gonna be a game like that so it can exercise the brain muscle. You know, so um, we try to, we put together, well I'm putting together a demo app where the kids gonna create a game. You know, it's gonna be a simple game, kind of like, kind of like Tetris in a sense that I'm gonna help them code so they can get an idea of how fun it can actually be. You know, a lot of times kids get discouraged when it comes to math and reading because they don't know how, or they might learn it differently or slowly or, you know, different things like that. So how it works is we're gonna have this big setting, like it's gonna be a, a smart board that, um, that we're gonna have. And the idea of it is to pretty much have kids come up and be able to interact with the board to code the pieces together to see the outcome. Because a lot of kids, they take pride in what they do. Just like their parents, they take pride in what they do. Um, they want it to look good, they want people to know about it. So how my team and I is helping is pretty much just trying to come down with concrete um, lessons to pitch the idea to do some PS, or pitch the idea to it's pretty much coming down to principles, just getting in the door of things. Cause a lot of times each school has their own budget, you know, and if they can put it in there, then they put it in there. I mean, I I can't pay I can't pay bills with passion. <laughs> I wish I could, you know what I'm saying? But to be honest, like right now, um, out of the two thousand that we need, we raised like eight hundred and eighty nine dollars, you know, and, and once we hit that two thousand we could be able to take the necessary steps to get it started. You know, and um, a lot of times people don't understand, it got all it have to do is start in one spot. A lot of universities, even I know Morgan State University started in a church. All they had was a small building. And now if you go up there on Cold Spring, they buy blocks by blocks, you know? <laughs> so it's like, we have to start somewhere. So even if I can get one classroom, or if anybody in here would know someone in the school system 
Not even a sense of just asking for a big space. It could be a small, the smallest space we can, as long as we can get kids in there. You know, so right now we're looking at recreation centers. We're looking at different public spaces where we can help out. But we always ask people, and we ask parents, and we have students and teachers, like, you want to know how you can contribute to the struggle of liberation. Like, how, how can you contribute? You know, by helping us raise these funds, or by volunteering with different things. You know, it's so many different ways. And like, that's why I tell people, financial is just, being financially set is one way. You know, but if we don't invest in our kids' future, how can we set them up for success? You know, um, we don't have the million dollar loans, or we don't the million dollars trust funds to wake up to or we'll be born and stuff like that, so. Not yet. Yeah, not yet, you know. <laughs> Or something close to it where we're all eating. Um, let's give a brother a hand in your hand, y'all, please. All right, so in a second, uh, as we do q and I'm going to get a basket to come through. Uh, you can give as much as, or as little as you have, you know. There's no, there's no set, you know, this is a free program, but we want to upgrade the technology a bit so that, you know, we're going out to the world you know um, with savvy technology you got to keep up with the times you know there's much access to technology we have to grasp it so in a second the basket's going to go around but i'm going to ask the first person who wants to ask a question to uh, take the mic and just let your dialogue so i saw your hand well, if you could just introduce yourself and then i'll uh, ask your question here you go standing whichever way how do you feel comfortable hey, um i'm not I am um, a uh, techie, Angular JS PHP founder. I created my own version of Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. Um, and it would be cool if, if, if I can also um, pay Bitcoin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I only use Bitcoin. I don't touch cash. I really, really touch cash. I don't use Bitcoin. Like I live on Bitcoin. I live on Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Yeah, I need to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> it was zero, it was two cents at one point. So um, with that said, um, awesome, awesome that you actually included tech into the approach. Um, that is a huge frustration that, uh, um, um, that I experienced for quite some time. Right? Um, regardless of the ambitions, everybody wants to do great things, but the minute you say, hey, look, um, you know what, what's your tech solution? And all of a sudden, everybody goes quiet. So, kudos on that. Right. Um, with that said, the part about um, teaching the kids to code, um, if there's any way at all that I can uh, play a part in that, please um, uh, let me know. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be physical, right? It can just be online. Okay. Right. Um, and if there are any other needs uh, um, as well, uh, um, you know, where, where we can participate, please let me know. Okay, we'll do, we'll do, man. Right. Uh, with that said, um, the question, if I can remember it, specifically is, um, in dealing with HBCUs, right, I had an experience with Howard where um, I literally went to the computer science professors and like, y'all are not teaching the kids the latest technology. Like, any kid that's graduating now is not gonna be able to work with any of the apps that you have in phone, right? So how do you plan on actually getting through to the computer science professors themselves, the folks who actually put together the curriculum and are getting to the kids or to the young people um, you can try to sidetrack them and just go directly to the young people, but at the end of the day, they're still going to spend four hours in that class. Uh, how much I'm, I'm time in that class getting the wrong information? Or not up to date information? Um, so. What I would say is, like, when it comes to how many people went to an HBCU or go to an HBCU? Well, we got we got quite a few. So when it comes to HBCUs, we already know how they test your patience, right? <laughs> Burst our office, one of the main places that tells you, you know, what your financial aid and things like that. Um, but the one thing I can say is, at my time when I was at Morgan, a lot of things got changed because of the 
because of the ways we because of the way we did things. So when it came to policy change or curriculum change, we would go to the professor, we would go to the chairperson, we would go to all these different people, and then we got to take actions. Like one ways we did that, we did we actually had sit-ins in the president office. That was big. Like that was big for us. Like because do I think about it? Do you work for the teachers or the teachers work for you? Without you, it's no, they don't have no job. A lot of times, professors don't let you know that. A lot of professors, they get paid, per, like, depending on how many students they have in their class, per credit. Like, if they have a certain amount of um, students that's taking the credit, then that's how they get paid, that's how they get their paycheck. So what we did was, after we learned that, um, we had one person that was an official, like someone that was in the office, but we had the student body. That's who, that's who we, we tackled. So if, if we can work between that elected official or whoever that's in the office and also someone, the student base, then we can get the attention. So how it works is like, they break it down for you. We sit right there, we go in, um, we tell them our problem. A lot of times people have problems, but they don't have solutions. That's just being real. Like a lot of times we can say right here that this space is too small, so where we gonna go? Nobody have an idea. So when it comes to the curriculum and how to set up, you know, our students for the future, we have to be able to, we have to talk their language. We have to talk their language. Like, I can, come, I can talk to y'all right here and say, I want to be pro-black, I want liberation for all my people, and things like that. Right now, I'm in an eBay competition, a small business competition. When I go to them, I tell them the same thing, but it's a little different. Because they are intimidated. They are intimidated by they are intimidated by change. If you wake up in the morning every day, brush your teeth, and go to work, someone try to change that, it's kinda hard. You know, so you gotta you gotta move at their pace. That, that would be my advice, just move at their pace. Just just find a loophole. You might sit right there, they might say, I can't get through to these students to do X or Y, Z. But you got an idea on how to do that. So you let them know. Hey, professor, I can help you with your problem if you help me with mine. That's all it is, like being able to, I guess, barter, create the barter system to the point where they understand it. So, yeah, just when it comes to curriculum, just trying to back it. A lot of times, a lot of teachers, they sit there, they have the same curriculum, or they have the same agenda for 20, 30 years. And everything else is changing except for their curriculum. You know, so, um, so yeah, one thing I would say is just being able to just Find what you can do, like find something that they need, and you can find. But go, go in there. Don't go in there in the sense of so forward, but straightforward, because they get intimidated. Once they get intimidated, then they're not gonna want to do business. They're not gonna do want to do anything with you. So if I would have came in here right now and say, oh, everybody download the app," it's like, "Oh, who we talking to? What you talking about?" You know. So just trying to find a way where you can balance the the or build a relationship. You know, once you do that, then they can actually hear you out. And they need proof, they want to see something. So, if you can provide something, give them a, a small presentation on how it, it'll affect them or it'll help them in some way, then they're all for it. You know, so. Um, some short questions. Um, what platforms do your app run on? So, the app itself is ran on the app, so it's ran on iOS, and it also run on Google. I uh, mean, like the platform where you can where you can download it. No, no, no. I mean, Android, Mac. It's a text app. Android, iOS. Yeah. So it's on. So you can download. So how how it worked was I used the um, Android Studio, which is a coding system, and I use. Xcode, which was another. No, no. I, so it runs on Android operating system. It runs on iOS. Yes, yeah, okay. too. That, that's the platform. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, second, um, have you considered doing a desktop version? Um, I did, um, but just after, as of right now, we are, we are mobile because of the fact of how the trend of things is going. Um, a lot of times, just a smaller percentage of people that sit at the desktop right now. A lot of times, everything is mobile. Everything is mobile, and I, and I thought about the desktop version of it, and we are gonna incorporate that with our website. So right now, the, the website is just a landing page 
for the two platforms. Okay, last, last question. Is your code base under version control and have you considered open sourcing it so pe more people can work on it? Um, yes and... Yes to what? Yes to the version mode. And, but the sec so your second question was to make it accessible? Open sourcing open source. the code. Open source, so I thought about it and we said in the works with it, like I said, my team and I, like we just, we're trying to figure out the best way where we can continue to grow. That's the biggest thing. Um, so once we come up with it, we actually talked about that, but to come up with a definitive answer, we still, we still mapping out some things that we want to work on. Okay, I, I, would, I would encourage you to open source it put it on the Git version control um, and, and, and document the hell out of it. All right, yes, sir. I'm, I'll talk to you later about that. All okay, right. no problem. Right here. Stay right there. Yeah, I'm old school, man. <laughs> and uh, I say that sincerely because I got grandchildren that are much younger than you and very sharp with tech. But I want to commend you first, especially on today, being the 131st birthday of the right Honorable Marcus Monsai Coffee, and you being a visionary and a builder like he was when he was young. My uh, question to you may be able to be answered. If it can't be answered totally or partially, fine, because I'm working with all eyes on DC. Now I want to work with you, yes, sir. but I ain't trying to get into a lot of the tech stuff because like I'm old school, like I said, uh, I'm on overload with tech. I mean, I do Skype calls, I, tr I, I do telephone conferencing, I teach online, I do too much of that stuff and I'm trying to concentrate on building my stamina so I can go another 30 years, you hear what I'm saying? So, but we got Harambe Radio that's 14 years of age, self-sustaining, we built it. Internet radio network. All I, uh, Sam has been on it. We definitely got to get you on it. Yes, Secondly, we got the CBPM, which is called the Collected Black People's Movement, which is collecting data what black people are doing all over the world. That's been around a long time. That's based in Atlanta. Sec also, we got Us Lifting Us. And when I say we, because it's not about me, it's time for elders my age to get off of the we factor and to deal with, I mean, get off the me factor and deal with the we factor, which means we gotta stay youth advocates. So we gotta learn from you all, not just give you our knowledge and wisdom, but learn from you all, because you all gonna be the long distance runners in the 21st century. I'm not gonna be too much longer. We got Us Lifting Us, which is building virtual, economic, sustainable community. It's a cooperative, it's big. And I, I'm telling this so everybody can Google it, but I'm gonna give you all the information. That's based out of Atlanta, but it's not, it's global actually. It's called Us Lifting Us. It's a cooperative profit for profit. Okay, that's important. Okay, then we also got Brother Heru Forayata, who built Movement Tunes years ago, which was built out of, well, he built it virtually after he came back from Africa. He's originally from Ghana, and he saw iTunes, so he built Movement Tunes. That sells music, black music, and conscious raising music all over the world. Barbados Business Association saw it and saw the vision of it and invested in it. So that's got a life of its own. It's called Movement Tunes. And there are many others. I'm only using these as examples because my point to you is you need to interface with them so that they learn from you and you can tie into what they're doing so you can, have, you can grow. All of those are self-sustaining businesses but are run cooperatively. Uh, I see what you're doing as being Wait, strong vision down the road. I, while you were here, I went on. I went on the site, and man, I'm impressed. Appreciate it. As I, as you would be with some of the things I just shared with you. So my, my question to you, and, and you could give an answer, is how how can we interface immediately? Because time is of essence, and right now the universe is open. We need to get away from all that other stuff and be self reliant and collaborate and consolidate. But if we don't do it with your generation, we're going to miss the boat. So anyway, I want to thank you. I'm going to pass the mic to somebody else. You can ask that question. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, I think for, um, I've been sitting sit down a little bit. Um, for me, I think how we can do that is, as I'm learning, which we, we, we don't get talked to about this enough, but the barter system. 
you know, we we exchange goods for goods, service for service. Um, that's huge. So when I first started this app, I'm like, you know, let me get some money. You know, I can put you on my app for some money. But then it came a point in time where I had companies say, I can make these t-shirts for you. And you can put me on your app. And we can exchange. So just just the view that you made is is I'm looking at just the bill. We have to understand that we have customers that come in this country probably without a social security number, but they still get their foot in the door when it comes. Why? Because we like to trust in each other. That's one thing. Now, if you told me all this and you gave me information, I'm like, nah, I ain't really about to deal with that. Then how are we going to build unification? How are we going to build it? Like I said earlier, like, we sit right here, we all have a different agenda in life. We all got different goals in life. Some might be materialistic, some might. Some might want to be economical, or some might just want to just live simple. So many different things. But it's like, when it comes to this platform and what we're trying to do, like, like you said, this is the time. Like, we've been suffering for so long, and we've been patient for so long, to the point where we don't got tomorrow. We don't got tomorrow. We get gunned down over and over, we see that. You know, we get, um, it was just a story that I read about how black farmers got bad seeds. Bad seeds. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, they try any way possible right. to knock us down. And all we got is ourselves. You know, so I'm looking forward to getting the information and, and building. Because, like I said, this, this, this system that we in, we take credit for everything. The African created everything in the world, except for white supremacy. That's the one thing that we give them credit for. They don't got no culture. They, don't got, they got history, but it's not the history that, it's not the rich history that we need to unlock for ourselves. So yeah, we could definitely build and, and connect to things like that. Yeah, so my name is John. So my name is John. Um, I'm a part of the Living Just Enough podcast, which is why I'm out here today. We cover a lot of stuff that you're talking about, so just wanted to see it firsthand and all that. Also, Morgan State alumni, hey, so shout out to you, Brett. Congrats, man. Um, I've already downloaded the app like a week ago when I saw it on Sam's Instagram page. And so I like like the news feed and the stories that are presented on it. It's really up-to-date things that we need to know about what's going on in our surroundings, so I appreciate that. But I was wondering, since you coded it yourself, like I was wondering, I was gonna ask you that. Have you considered offering like coding courses or outreach for entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs that wanted to start up an app or transition whatever they're doing to an app? Like have you considered doing that through the, for the culture app or through another platform? Just showing people how to code or giving them advice on where to start or what they need to do. Cause that's something that, we're, we have a podcast on YouTube and all that stuff, Living Just Enough, but of course we would, would like to have it in the app, you know what I'm saying? So would you consider doing something like that, offering assistance? <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> when, it's, when it's over, um, my brother Talib, he, going, he, going, he always talk about this. He always talk about how to utilize the skill that I have. And um, it's interesting because we actually, in the next six months, we are gonna have, um, webinars where you can sign up um, where it's going to be affordable because the thing is to be honest i had one refund one refund check left from school and i had the sales for my book i put all that together and i put it into the app i'll be honest creating the app developing the app getting it on the app store all that cost it costs but what we can do is we can get y'all added to the app you build your following, and then you can you can you can fundraise, you can kickstart to get your app available. You know that's that's one of the biggest things that I learned. Cause a lot of times, under one percent of black businesses get approved for bank loans. No matter what your credit is, that's just how it works. Like unless you got this crazy credit score, you got someone that that don't mind doing it. Like I said, we like to trust in each other. If all of us in here want to start a business together and you got the highest credit score in here to get a bank loan, you're going to say, I'm not about to do that. 
But like I said, you got other groups of people that do it. They trust and they believe in each other. And like I said, what I can do is, since we already at a platform, uh, we've been out for 10 months and we have um, $80 downloads, we can definitely get y'all on there. We can give y'all your own tab, you have your own following, you can um, you get people to put that, make a profile for your, for your podcast, things like that, and then we can push it. Like, it's all about collectivism. Like, the European, and I know I'm about to wrap it up, the European taught us how to think individually. Because as a collective, we're the strongest group of people in the world. You know, so if all of us sit right here and, and put our minds together to get things done, then it'll work out. You know, because your podcast is needed. You know, the organizations that you mentioned is needed. Like, everything don't just come because of coincidence. All these ideas, the app, the book, the organization, the podcast, the law firm, anything that happens is because the ancestors want you to know this. So like I said, again in the beginning, we have a mission. Either we either we accomplish that mission or we abandon that issue, that, that mission. And to be honest, people, a lot of generations abandon the issue, but it's not over yet. It's just beginning. Because like I said, with our souped up energy as millennials and with the wisdom of our ancestors, what they say, we our ancestors while the dreams, right? You know, so it's like, it all started here. Like things like this, this is a safe haven for people. You know, this is a place where people would come, get books they never heard of, and equip yourself for this war that we battle each and every day out there. Mm. Let's give brother a high hand. Definitely great all eyes on DC programming here tonight. Um, one more time, we got the sign-in sheet in the middle of the room right there. If you have not done so already, please sign up with your email address. If you're interested in what BMP is, um, please notate that in the third column as well for uh, future reference, all right? We got some things bubbling up. There's always been things bubbling up, but the All Eyes on DC show is your show as well. So this is a conduit for the Black African nation. So if you have anything, any nation building mechanism that you want to pitch, if you want to talk about a specific issue, you know, please reach out. Uh, because each month has a different theme, and those themes allow us to give people like a hottie a platform to talk about what they're doing, but for us to also talk about aspects of our liberation. Real quick before I shut down the program for the night, next month we're going to venerate our ancestors, as we always do on All Eyes on DC. But this, specifically, this upcoming show is all about the ancestors. Um, we have a woman out of Montgomery County, an activist who has long been in the game, uh, and she is going to talk to us about their efforts out there to pretty much save uh, a space beneath which there is an ancient African burial site. Uh, the remains of 500 ancestors in an unmarked grave um, that the county is trying to build an apartment or a condo over. And right now, they're trying to make it a parking lot, so they've been working on that for quite some time. If you guys know about River Road, River Road was where they pretty much moved our people during Reconstruction because the land there was red clay and what they thought was barren. But African people can make something out of nothing each and every time. So as is always the case, right, when we build it up, they see what it, they see what it got and what do they do? They, do, they take every effort to boot us out of there. So interesting fact, a lot of people from Rockville, black African people during the 50s, the late 50s and 60s moved into DC because they were gentrified out of Rockville. So people think Montgomery County is so white, but that ain't right. So, you know, it's, it's actually a lot blacker than what you think. You know, if you look at Tacoma Park, you know, you got that enclave right there, you know, uh, a very pan-African enclave out there. You look at Highsville to some extent, the blacks and the Latinos out there, but the Latinos, they are cousins in a sense too. They got that African blood. Some of them know more than others, but you know, that's just the case what it is. So please check that out next month. And I also passed out some stuff related to some activities and initiatives that we also got. There's a lot going on in Vatican City, DC. You know, so the 26th, uh, the UNIA, Division 330, they got an event at Thurgood Marshall Center. 
around Marcus Garvey celebration. Dr. Jeff Mancis is going to be there. Uh, CR Gibbs is going to be there. We got Baluke on the ones and twos on the mic, pretty much serenading the audience. It's going to be a wonderful night. And we also got the All Eyes on DC uh, um, writing workshop come September 15th in the Third Road Marshall Center as well. We got the Man Cave Initiative up at Henry Heights, okay? So we're looking for strong black African um, men to come out and mentor the young fellas out there. Remember, we got to change the paradigm, y'all. These fellas, they don't know how to approach black, Afri black African women. They don't know how to work for themselves. They want to know. Right, and they might say that they don't want to know, but they do want to know. So we got to step in and fill in that gap to save our nation and do right by our counterparts and do right by our children. My name is Sam P.K. Collins, a.k.a. Raspo Queer Glove World. This is the All Eyes on DC show, and you guys are a beautiful, beautiful part of the nation. Now go on out and tell the world what you saw today. Peace and blessings. Yeah, I wish, man. They got Bitcoin. Uh, they got Bitcoin. They got Bitcoin. Yeah. They got Bitcoin on Cash App, too. Uh, I think the, 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 the,